Why, why would we uh, study Hegel, a philosopher who lived more than 200 years ago? I mean, if you ask uh, a lot of uh, modern or postmodern so-called thinkers, all they can think about is new ideas, new things, you know, new way of doing, them, uh, doing things. And they always present themselves like this kind of a complete break with the past, although in reality they're just mimicking, they're just repeating what's been said many times before in history. But for these people, progress in history and progress in, in the history of ideas <coughs> is just a figment of our imagination. Uh, and it has no reality to it. But if we take even a superficial look, we see that that's not really true. If we look at uh, literature, did it, did it, didn't it change completely after Homer or after Shakespeare? Could it ever go back to the way literature was before that? Or if we take a look at music, could it ever be the same after Bach or after Beethoven or after Beatles? Is there a book? Is there a book called that? <laughs> Bach, Beethoven, Beatles? <laughs> I think there is. Um, um, or within within science, could it ever be the same after Newton, Darwin, and, and 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 similar people? Of course, all of this is just a closed book to these people because they never really actually take the time to even do a, a superficial inquiry of, of what they're what they're talking about. But as Marxists, we never claim to be special or having found some kind of magical formula that no one accidentally thought about for all these thousands of years and come up with this solution. Um, we emphatically put ourselves in, within a long line of thinkers going obviously through uh, Trotsky, Lenin, Marx and Engels, but even further through uh, Hegel, the French materialist, Aristotle, Heraclitus, ancient Greek philosophy, um, all of these form our heritage. And in fact, our heritage is not just these people, but these people as a representation of the, of the um, how do you say, common experience of mankind uh, I I itself. Marx and Hegel are very, very, very keen students of, of Hegel. Uh, and Hegel, in fact, had a similar view of, of, of history, of philosophy itself. He didn't see himself as someone who just threw aside all previous history. Um, on the contrary, uh, he, saw, he saw the scientific thought not as a history of random ideas by random people, but as this progressive unfolding of truth, of scientific knowledge from, from lower to higher levels. Uh, each philosophy in its own day played a progressive role, played an enormous role in developing our, understand, our understanding of the world and our place in it. Um, but at the same time, each advance carried within it the seeds to its own downfall. Each philosophy, each set of ideas within it had its contradictions, which at a certain stage meant that they couldn't play the role that they, that they used to. And therefore, those ideas were then negated by a new school of thought, a new way of looking at the world, which was on a, high, on a higher level. So every school of philosophy and every system of thought which negated another one was, was, was bound to collapse itself and give way to another, uh, which was... Um, so, so, so that meant that what was true at one point in history was inadequate uh, to explain the truth at another point. But this, this didn't mean that these, these negated schools of thought, thoughts just disappeared forever, that they were just lost and just thrown aside. But <coughs> that, that their rational kernel or their um, essence was in fact maintained within uh, the development of consciousness and, and scientific thought altogether. We can look at a school such as the Pythagorean school. Now, um, the Pythagoreans, it, a lot of people don't know this, but in reality they were a mystic sect. It was a, re, it was a religious sect which worshipped ideas and they you know, basically they were the uh, founders of philosophical I idealism. But not many people know that about them. But yet what a lot of people, almost every school student learns <laughs> today is the scientific developments that they actually did make and, and which were a breakthrough for science and, and, and for maths at, at that time. So the, the essence of that school of thought was, was maintained, was kept, whereas all the accidental, all the, uh, uh, um, well, yeah, accidental elements and sides of it was, uh, was, was, was discarded. Uh, and the same we can say about uh, throughout the history of, of, of philosophy, a history of thought, that there have been many, many 
people think as uh, schools that we don't really know about or don't really really know what they were about, but the uh, the uh, essence of the conclusions that they reached has been maintained within the, our consciousness and within our, within our thinking. At least in general terms, that's the outline of the process. Um, now Hegel believed that his philosophy, uh, correctly, was the culmination of all previous philosophy and that it carried within it the true essence of all of these previous systems of thought. Um, and, and that he was kind of the, the, the final step in this uh, progressive approximation uh, uh, towards the truth, this, un this unfolding of the truth, uh, as he would call it, about the, uh, and our understanding of the laws of nature and of society and our place within, within those spheres. Now, he explained that everything uh, which rises is rational at a certain stage. Every school of thought which rises is, is rational at a certain stage. But it's also doomed um, by its own inner contradictions to become irrational and pass away at a later stage. Now this process of negation, this process of everything rising and then being negated and falling into their opposite, is according to Hegel uh, the key to his philosophy. Because it's not just something uh, in human thought and culture and, and, and within philosophy, but, it, but it's something that permeates all of human society, all of nature, all of development. Uh, he likens it, he, he compares this with the, uh, with the bud, which by its own essence has to develop into, uh, into, into, a, into a flower, into, a, into blossom. But by doing that, by fulfilling its own inner necessity, it completely negates itself. It doesn't exist anymore. It, 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 it gives way to the blossom, which then again disappears as the manifestation of that plant when the flower comes. And you see here three stages of development of a plant, each of which completely uh, negate the other one, i.e. they cannot coexist, but at the same time they're necessary for uh, the, 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 the existence of, of, of each other. Um, in, his, um, in his logic, he starts off by, by, by asking the question, what is pure being? And if we, we think about it, you can't really think about it. What is pure being? Being that's not determined, it's not limited, it's not in any way qualified, it's just pure being. You can't even say it because then you actually add some, uh, some letters to it and you shouldn't do it because then it's not really, <laughs> really true. It's, it's nothing. Eventually you reach to the conclusion that it's nothing. You cannot add any characteristics to it. And therefore pure being, immediately as you start be begin, to begin to think about it, collapses into nothing. Uh, and because it shares the same characteristics as, as, as with, with, with nothing. But this isn't just nothing now, because obviously it's something, because we know that it's definitely not being. So it's not nothing. <laughs> so it's not being, we can say. And therefore, even within this completely abstract thought experiment, we see the fundamental law of nature that, that he Hegel discovered, that everything taken to the logical conclusion by their own inner contradiction, fall, fall into, their, uh, into their opposite. And instead of being, what we have is becoming, of development, of change, which carries within it this, this, this constant movement from being to nothing, this constant movement from <coughs> one thing to, to, to its other. Um, yes. Yes. And it, this, is, this is the fundamental uh, point that, that, that Hegel makes, that everything is in constant change. And everything is constantly coming into being and passing away. As soon as a person is born, you basically begin to die. Uh, every cell which is created within our body has a certain time where it lives, and then it, and then it passes away. In the beginning of our life, more cells are created then than, than die off. But at a certain stage, this, this changes to its opposite, and you have the beginning of the decline of, uh, uh, or like the, the period of decline of our lives. And this, at a certain stage, again, reaches a critical stage at which we see a rapid acceleration, and then we die. 
Uh, but obviously, our death is not the end of hum humanity or human society, just like our birth wasn't the begin beginning of it. We are, we are descend you know, we can trace ourselves back to our ancestors, to our parents and their parents, and we can go back to our generations, our ancestors, and we can go all the way back to the birth of, uh, of humanity itself and link it again in, within the same process with, it, with, with the development of species, you know, going back through the primates and trace our roots all the way back to, um, to the first one-celled organisms. And even further be before that, before matter uh, actually began to organize itself into, into, into living uh, matter. Um, now, at each step, each new species or each new kind in, in, in this development represents a, a step forward. It, it's on a higher level, we can say, uh, within the organization of matter. Um, and, and that's why we see throughout the history of, of, of development of species, we see the long line of species, the majority of which have gone extinct, but, it, but it grad, you know, the, the continuous uh, onward progress from lower to higher levels of, of, of species. And, and uh, yes. And again, uh, just like in the development of philosophy, we see that each step forward is not like a, a random, completely random step forward, but uh, and, and a complete reset. But that it carries within it the the, the, the essence and the seeds of, of the of the previous uh, uh, previous thing that it comes from. Every new species negates, but at the same time preserves the essential aspects of, of the old one. Of course, within the history of, of, of species and, and, and life, there's all kinds of dead ends and, and steps back. And, but in general terms, that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the, the process that we're watching. In fact, we can see this whole process within the development of human, the human fetus, which mimics the development of life since its early stages on our, plan on our planet until the development of, of, of human beings. <coughs> this constant change and the rise or fall of all phenomena uh, from lower to higher levels, that's the fundamental mode of existence of all matter. But this change is not, it's not imposed from it from outside. It's rather driven by its own internal uh, contradictions. Just like pure being, as we talked about, inevitably becomes its opposite. Death is, a, is, a, is, is an outcome of the um, internal contradiction of, of, of life, and so on and so on. But this change, once it happens, it's not a gradual change necessarily, but more like a rapid acceleration or a jump. Once, uh, once we, we can see that a body reaches a certain stage uh, of decline, we see that, that this, the process takes on a rapid pace, and <laughs> death occurs very fast. Or likewise, after a certain period of, of the fetus being within, within a womb and growing to a certain age, birth is, is imposed very, very quickly. And a similar thing, obviously, we can see in social revolutions, and that once a certain, uh, a certain society has reached a certain stage, it enters into a state of decline. And from here, we begin to see that the contradictions between the rule of the old uh, ruling class and the rise of the new uh, revolutionary class begin to begin to pile up, and at a critical stage, at a critical point, uh, any given accident can make all these contradictions come to the surface, and we see the beginning of, of, of social revolution. Um, so it's not difficult to see that Hegel's uh, the 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 implications of Hegel's uh, philosophy were very very revolutionary. But Hegel never reached these conclusions explicitly himself. It was more implied in, in, his, in his writings. Uh, and although he, um, he sympathized with the French Revolution, but politically he was a conservative. Uh, but how, the question is, how can it be that you reach these revolutionary uh, ideas, conclusions in the, in, in the sphere of philosophy, and yet remain a conservative? And that's what we're going to look into a bit now. Now, throughout history, we can generally divide uh, philosophy into two camps. Very generally, very broadly speaking, we have on the one hand the, the camp of idealism, which subsists of, of, of people who say that <laughs> the fundamental basis, the fundamental building blocks or ba basis of, of the world 
is ideas, or some form of, of, of ideas. Uh, and that matter and everything else is kind of, in one way or another, a reflection of that. And all religion falls into this category, and all, other, all philosophies in this category uh, inevitably will fall into uh, religion. On the other hand, we have the school of materialism, which claims that the material world is all there is, is all there exists, and exists independently of us and our ideas, and that our ideas are just a, um, an imperfect reflection of this material world. Now, Hegel was, thanks, Hegel was waging a struggle against the, with the weaknesses of, of both of these camps at his time. On the one hand, he was struggling against the, um, the rationalist idealists, who, um, who in their search for these eternal truths had completely <coughs> cut off themselves uh, from the real objective world uh, by, by more or less denying its existence or, or our ability to interact with it. And on the other hand, he was fighting against the empiricists who believed that pure sense perception was all that human beings could, del could, could deal with. That knowledge, in, in essence, was just like a, 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 an ever-increasing accumulation of facts, of, of, uh, of more and more facts without really processing them, without ordering them, without having a system of categorizing and understanding the <coughs> relations. Um, and the thinker who came, or the philosopher who came immediately before uh, Hegel was Immanuel Kant, who, although he made some brilliant discoveries, but his, his, his biggest uh, contribution perhaps was his failed attempt to unite these two worlds. And he, these two camps, and he ended up in, in, a, in a dualist philosophy, i.e., a philosophy which accepted the real world as existing and independent of us, but also accepted the world of ideas, and basically did not accept that these two had any connection with each other. Kant said that although the world exists outside of outside of our reach and independently of us, but we can never know the world as it is. We can never know it or the thing in itself, as he called it. And instead, our, our minds are, are kind of inhabited by these a priori ideas, which he never explained uh, where, where they really uh, came from. Um, now, Kantianism, as opposed to Hegelianism, is very, very popular in, in uh, bourgeois academia today. But in philosophical terms, it was, it was a dead end from, from the beginning. Now, nevertheless, or perhaps because of this, it became um, the basis, it was on the basis of the critique of Kant that Hegel developed his, his philosophy. Um, and he dealt a devastating blow to Kant's idealism. First, or, or, sorry, by, uh, to Kant's dualism. Firstly, he pointed out that if we're unable to, to perceive reality as it is, and if we cannot prove the existence of, of anything that, that, we, that, we, that we're experiencing, then how can we be sure at all that it exists? How can we be sure at all that anything outside of our mind, outside of our, our being, exists at all? And if we don't know this, then why would Kant even bother writing all these books about this world of philosophy for people that he didn't really know or could prove existed? Or at least, uh, if they did, did, maybe didn't even understand his language, or didn't really know what he was doing, right? scribbling on these, uh, these pieces of paper. Uh, but Hegel went further. He said that... that um, Philosophy, and logic in particular, is a, is a special kind of science because what is it? It's, it's thinking about thinking. And it's not just ordinary thought. It's thinking about scientific thinking. But in any other science, you can uh, make experiments. You can come with hypotheses. You can somehow test them out in the real world. But how do you prove your thoughts are correct? How do you, how do you prove that this, this thought this way of thinking is better than the other one. Because uh, every man can come and say, well, in my brain, the way I'm thinking, my logic is better than yours. And you have no way of proving it because we're just fighting it out in, the wor in, in our own heads. Um, now, as long as philosophy, Hegel said, was kept within the realm of pure thinking, that as long as thinking and, and, and thought was, was kept kind of uh, how is it, isolated from the real world, from the objective world that, that we live in, then it could never overcome this. And, it was, and logic was always bound to have, you know, at best, a, a, a very mechanical and, and, and a rigid uh, character. Um, so, but he overcame this by replacing this dualism of Kant 
with what he called absolute idealism, or what we would call objective idealism. And what he said was that there is no distinction between the material world and the ideal world because everything is the ideal world. Everything is this idea, this, uh, this absolute idea, universal spirit. He had several names for us, or, <coughs> although he never really explained what it was. Um, but that is all of the world. And this, this, this artificial, the, the barrier that we have set up between our mind, our thoughts, and the real world that we, that we see and experience are artificial. And it's only by, by removing them that we can actually test out our, our, our thoughts in, within the real world and, and prove them right or wrong. Um, now, on the one hand, <laughs> uh, sorry, and so, so everything says, everything that we sense and experience is a part of this, this, this world spirit or this world idea. Now, on the one hand, this had uh, a, re a reactionary side to it because it, it let obscurantism, a religious thought, basically, into, into um, uh, Hegel's uh, philosophy. But at the same time, he had a very, very re revolutionary um, side, which, meant, which was that for the first time, that we could begin to, to deal with this ever-changing, you know, extremely complex and infinite world uh, we, could, we can begin to develop our ideas on the basis of that, and we can begin to develop gen general laws and, and, um, uh, and notions on the basis of observing uh, this infinitely complex uh, world of ours. Um, and, we can, and, and according to Hegel, he could prove his logic by applying it to the real world, and by studying the history of the sciences, um, uh, and thereby building a scientifically provable logic. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So according to Hegel, his logic was just, um, how do you say, the highest form of all the positive sciences, which would e eventually give, uh, give, feed, you know, give its, its flesh. Now continuing on crit criticizing uh, the rationalists who argued that um, absolute truth existed outside of the material world and which could only be true, uh, attained by this pure type of thinking, uh, Hegel would say that this philosophical thinking only, um, sorry, could, could never really, uh, you know, even, you know, you come up with these great ideas of eternal truths and eternal ideas, big things like God and spirit, but however big and, and grandiose you would, you would portray them, you could never ever really explain the infinite complexity and change and, 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 um, and interconnection of uh, the real world. So here you had a world in the 1800s, especially, where science was taking these immense uh, strides forward, uh, and all this immense wealth was coming to our uh, to our hands. And the philosophers, these philosophers in particular, were building a wall around themselves and saying, "No, no, no, we can't touch this. We can't have anything to do with this. We can't learn." And they were isolating themselves from uh, this new world of uh, of knowledge. On the other hand, you had the empiricists um, who argued that pure sense experience was all that was needed to understand the world uh, and that no abstract thinking was, 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 was really needed. But they couldn't really explain, explain anything either. So how would you ever um, uh, choose and prioritize and, and uh, recognize the relationship between this infinite amount of information that we're constantly dealt with. Even, a, even an empiricist would never do that. Uh, by, you know, because when I'm sitting here looking at you guys, I'm not looking at this tiny you know, speck of dust that's sitting here because although in a, in a formally empiricist way of thinking, that's equal to all the other things that I'm watching here, <laughs> like you guys and, and all the other things that we're talking about. Obviously, no one would ever think about the world in, in, in those uh, terms. Um, Yes. So Hegel argued that both of these assertions, the fact that you can uh, understand things by just general abstract ideas or just by looking at things empirically, could uh, explain, you know, had any depth to them. He, for him, they were both equally empty. And the point of philosophy is exactly to sort out the infinite number of phenomena that we see and connect and, and are in, in, in touch with um, and make sense of them 
and see the, the interconnections and the relationships and how they interact with each other. Uh, and see all the, the, these things which are not immediately visible um, to the naked eye. Now, if, for instance, we take a chair, uh, let's, let's take one, one of these chairs here, I can see that, well, yeah, that's a chair. But, in fact, the picture of a chair that we all have in our minds would probably be nothing like this chair or any other chair that we would ever see anywhere else before. Because that chair that we have is kind of stripped off of its accidental elements. And in fact, in a way, it's more true. It's, 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 it's just the e essence of what we recognize as, as a chair. But yet, it doesn't exist anywhere in the real world. It's only an abstraction that we have made. But this is, at the same time, this abstraction is only the abstraction made by, you know, throughout human experience of humanity, of, of having having studied and seen chairs and how they work and come to the conclusion that this is the essence of a chair. So within that abstraction itself, every single chair that I've ever met and, and many, many other people have, have, have seen in their lives is, is portrayed. And in this way, the, what is particular and what is universal is, 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 is related. That you, the, In order to understand the particular, you need to have a universal. We all have. Every time we see a, a person, the first thing is we don't go and see every single molecule, every, every you know, tiny uh, uh, building w way that they're built or, or built one way or another. But we, we actually we recognize them as this universal human being, man, woman, or, or whatever with certain traits. And then obviously then we begin to interact with them and we see, oh, okay, they also have other aspects that we, need to, that we need to look out for. And in understanding them, again, we enrich our understanding of that universal general idea of a man we have, the essence of human beings that we have, and, be, and we begin to understand human beings on an even uh, higher level. Um, now, so for Hegel, the philosophical truth is concrete. It's not something you, you attain by sitting in your room, sitting at the office, just, just writing and reading, reading textbooks, but it's something you attain by actually interacting with the world uh, as it is. And philosophical principles can't be predetermined in according to any, you know, in, a, in a schema and then pulled over the head or pasted onto the world as, as we know it. What he said was that in order to gain real knowledge, what we need to do is to surrender ourselves to the world that we, we're trying to understand and discover the, the underlying laws and, and, and necessities that, uh, that, 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 um, that dominate it the laws and logics of his organic life, so to say, uh, of the world. And in doing so, we'll, we'll begin to see that di there are different patterns which replicate themselves throughout nature and throughout human society. And once we begin to see this, once, once we begin to recognize these laws and this necessity which permeates all of being, all of, uh, uh, all of nature, all of talk of abstract freedom <laughs> is, uh, is immediately... Uh, we, can, we can discard immediately. Real freedom, according to Hegel, is the understanding of these laws which govern our nature and our society, and the understanding of our place within, within that society and within, within, within nature. But from his point of view, all of these laws were merely the laws of the development of this so-called absolute uh, spirit. And you can say, well, this is something completely un-Hegelian. Because nowhere does this follow from his system. Nowhere, if he, you know, Hegel will say, don't have any pre, pre uh, don't presume anything. Go into the world, discover it, and discover its own inherent laws. Well, if we do that, we'll never come across any form of uh, absolute idea. And in fact, if you take the absolute spirit out of Hegel's uh, work, all the main points, the essence of the main points, they remain. It's almost like a scaffold which is, which is just left there after they, 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 they build a house. Um, uh, but for Hegel, the history of nature and human society is the history of this absolute spirit. And this spirit, at some point you know, in prehistory, it's become alien to itself, whatever that means, and it's now returning to itself through the development of, of nature and especially through the development of philosophy. Um, of course, within Hegel himself, the spirit finally finds full cognition and supposedly is history you know, and history as a whole is beginning to, to come to an end. 
So here we have the man, you know, Hegel, who struck a blow to all, all schematism, all formalism, said nothing, nothing is, is, is absolute, nothing remains for everything, r rises and passes away. There's no system, there's no schemas, we cannot drag any schemas <coughs> over the real world. And yet, he creates the biggest system of the ball and the most complex schema and tries to drag this onto the world, although there's nowhere in the world any proof of the existence of such an uh, um, absolute spirit. But how can we explain why Hegel did that? First of all, we have to understand that Hegel was a Christian, and he came up through the school of German idealism. That's the tradition that he, that he belonged to. Um, a, a school of thought which at that time was far richer than the, 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 the British empirical school of uh, philosophy, for instance. And Hegel was looking at history and a society from the point of view of a philosopher and seeing his field as the driving force of, 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 of history. But also, why was he doing that? The society that he lived in, Germany, was perhaps the most backward, the most backward uh, society of, uh, of Europe because of the Thirty Years' War. The development of Germany had been withheld. German capitalism came late to the scene. And here you had this r relatively backward country in which literature was the highest and most developed uh, 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 aspect, and of course, this formed the, 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 the this formed the view that Hegel put uh, uh, took to to society. He saw himself, philosophy and literature, as the, the you know the, the decisive driving force of society. And this is kind of, he he kind of imposed on the rest of philosophy, uh, the rest of history uh, uh, as well, seeing the history of philosophy as the uh, the driving force of all of societies. <coughs> At least that's my hypothesis. Um, yes. But, um, but the problem was also another one in that, that the time of Hegel was just before the great breakthroughs that we saw in science in the, in the 19th century, in chemistry, in biology, in geology, all of these sciences which took enormous steps forward and which proved the, the, the dialectical method within nature, the dialectical... Uh, that dialectics is the mode of development and mode of movement of, of, throughout of nature. All of this was kind of a closed book to Hegel, and the, the sciences that he had access to were, for the most part, me mechanical sciences, such as mechanics, or astronomy, which at that time was you know, a sort of mechanic, because it was these great bodies and didn't go into the maybe uh, finer details uh, of it. Um, yes. And exactly because he anticipated all of these de developments, because he came before it, his system ended up being flawed. And it was Marx and Engels who had to salvage the revolutionary kernel of Hegel's philosophy, and as they, as they put it, turn him right side up. Now from a Marxist, Marxist point of view, there's, not, no such, uh, there's no uh, difference between the ideal and the material world. There is only the material world. Human beings and, and the human mind is a product of matter at a certain stage organized in a particular way. And our thoughts are just the imperfect reflection of that, of that material world. Uh, dialectics is not the laws of thought and idea which is then imposed or, or you know, transcends all of nature, but it's the inherent laws of, of nature uh, themselves. And by our interaction with this world and with, with nature, we're able to discover these laws. <coughs> Now, Lenin said that Marxism was, uh, Marxism was almighty because it's true, and this sounds like a very prophetic and you know, religious uh, statement. But actually, it's a very, very profound thing to say, in my opinion, because in that Marxism stands out from all other philosophies that came before it, in that it's not a system uh, that tries to impose a certain way of being on nature, but sees nature and the laws of nature that we can deduce from it as the, 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 its own content. And therefore, whatever nature uh, and laws of human society shows us, that's, that is the truth, and that is what Marxism aims at incorporating into its principles. And if it's not, it's our principles which will change, and not the other one. And therefore, it can, it can, uh, it's, it's a method which can, which can uh, last in any, any given situation. In that sense, it's also not a philosophy in, in the traditional form of philosophy. Um, it doesn't have a fixed scheme, uh, schema um, 
but it is more like a method of viewing the world and, and, and human society. Mankind, from Marx's point of view, is nothing but matter conscious of itself. And it also follows its own, uh, uh, it also, it's also ob object to its own laws. Individuals, obviously, you know, we think at least that we're free to make uh, the choices and decisions we want to in our lives. But if we take it just a little step back from a bird's eye view, we immediately see that there are iron laws which operate independently and often completely opposed to the wills of, of every single uh, individual. Um, I just, I don't know, there was, a, there was a lead off, unfortunately I didn't see it, about artificial intelligence. But just the other day I was thinking about this, this explosion of, of big data, you know, that big companies are now mining data of how we act. And they know every single move we make. And then they have these algorithms go through and find patterns in the way that we behave. And these patterns are actually relatively effective in predicting what we're going to do at a, any given time. And this is just the beginning of this, this form of uh, science. The same we can say about psych psychology um, and, and other sciences. It's only the beginnings of it. But what we're beginning to see is that, um, that there are laws which control human behavior and human uh, development that, that individual conscious human beings are not really uh, 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 lords uh, over. Um, now, for instance, the majority of ordinary people want to live a peaceful life. And in fact, it, pr uh, probably the, the people who want to have, who are the most uh, determined to live a peaceful and, and, and calm life, are constantly run running into capitalism as an insurmountable obstacle to living this. Where every single day we're, 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 we're pushed aside, uh, we're pushed at the job, we're put under all kinds of pressure in the family, in society, and everywhere we go by capitalist society, which impedes our very, very, you know, um, uh, modest uh, uh, wish, uh, wish to, to live a, a perfectly ordinary, non-eventful, and harmonious life. And hence, because of these pressures, because of the, the pressures that the crisis of capitalism puts on these people, you see that the people who are most determined to live a normal and tranquil life are pushed towards drawing more and more radical and more and more revolutionary uh, uh, conclusions, contrary to their wishes. And that, in fact, is the driving force of all revolutions. The, 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 the time where this consciousness, this conservative consciousness, switches over and becomes a, a, a revolutionary one and catches up with the, with the objective situation. Um, and if we look at human history, the laws are even more striking. And before anything, human beings have to eat, they have to sleep, and they have to subsist themselves. But in trying to do so, we have to develop tools, machinery, and the means of production to, to do this, essentially. Now, at a certain stage in, human society, in the development of human society, the, the development of these means of production mean that we create a certain, a little bit of a surplus value. We begin to produce a little bit more than we can all consume. And that means that a certain, a small group of people uh, are able to live without having to toil uh, day and night, basically. And that's when we see the rise of, of class society, which on the one hand was, was connected with enormous barbarism, but on the other hand, it drove forward, uh, it drove forward um, a human development uh, immensely. And at each stage of, uh, of class society, we see that the development of productive forces leads to enormous steps forward for humanity, humanity itself. Um, the, the rise of class, the early slave societies, for instance, especially where, what we see in, in, in Greece, coincides with the, com <coughs> with the explosion of flowering of culture and philosophy on a completely unprecedented uh, scale, especially in, in, in ancient Greece. But here again, it, you know, it, we see that philosophy was not the, the driving force of, of this movement. The Hegel would say, well, the Greek had this uh, beautiful, artful spirit, and that's why they, they reached this, this philosophy. But uh, the, the Greek philosophy was driven by the class contradictions which were rising in, in Greek society itself. And in fact, we see the, those class contradictions with, within the Greek philosophers as well. For instance, uh, the, the idealist camp, we see the most you know, determined or the most consistent idealist, Plato and um, uh, Par sorry, Pythagoras, they were, uh, they were mainly from the aristocratic uh, class. 
and they had this idea that you know, it, was, it was a class in a complete dead end, in a crisis, and their ideas was all about escaping this world, you know, which is unreal, and going to some other perfect world, or, uh, which, is, which is more real than the one that, that, that we live in. On the other hand, you had the materialist uh, philosophers in ancient Greek, who were mainly, for the most part, not, not, not all of them, from the trading class, from the, you can say, the, the embryonic bourgeois class, maybe, of traders, of sailors, people who would travel, who would study different sciences, and who would look at society from, the point of view, from a materialist point of, uh, point of view. And it was within those, that kind of context that these form of ideas uh, essentially developed. Uh, now, of course, slavery, uh, as well as slave society, reached, reached its apex in, in ancient Rome and buckled under its own uh, contradictions. And from its ruin, we saw the rise of feudalism. And from within feudalism, we again saw the rise of, of capitalism. And at each stage, the development of a given class society uh, develops to its full extent, which then again leads to its downfall and its supersession by a new, a new form of society. Um, and, uh, and also, within each of these uh, societies, we, we see that the revolutionary classes carry within them carry with them uh, their own revolutionary history. Capitalism, is, uh, sorry, philosophy, revolutionary philosophy. Capitalism itself came to power on the basis of a, of a, of a very ferocious struggle against feudalism and religious uh, obscurantism. It came to power fighting, uh, fighting for the truth of, of, and life, of you know, shedding light on everything that was hypocritical and irrational in, in, in human society. And its victory was a huge step forward for humanity <coughs> as a whole. Um, and under its rule, the, the, the means of production was developed to, uh, the, the, the productive forces was developed to unheard levels, which means that today, essentially, as we know, we have all the means at our disposal, uh, potentially, to solve all the main problems of, of humanity and raise all of humanity out of uh, uh, this, uh, this barbarism. But the system itself is incapable of doing so and is in, in, in instead pushing humanity further down this, this, line of, uh, this, this, this uh, line of barbarism. And therefore it becomes irrational and it's no longer, uh, in fact, is, is, is no longer in favor of the truth. And the truth is uh, the Marxists, or now the, who are, or the, the working class, who is now the revolutionary class, is the only standard bearer of the truth. Our philosophy is more than anything to find the truth because the truth essentially shows the irrationality and the incompatibility of capitalist society uh, with, with the, this, the, the, the whole of society and human progress as it is. Um, and within, within capitalism, of course, the society creates its own uh, grave diggers in the form of the working class, which can once and for all lead humanity out of this, this barbarism. Now, Freedom, from Marx's point of view, in this sense, consists in recognizing this process, in recognizing that in spite of everything we try to do, it, of, you know, all of us try to uh, improve our lives and our immediate surroundings as best as we can. Some people go study something, some people go study engineering or to become doctors or something else. They think, or they find one way or another to improve their lives and, and, and push society forward the way they can. But Marxist, Marxism is uh, the understanding that if whatever we do, all of these things in the final analysis is going to be futile because we have this gigantic, monstrous obstacle in form of, in form of uh, capitalist property relation uh, uh, in, in front of us, which impedes humanity from all of this, uh, this progress uh, in, in general. And therefore, the only the, the freedom is the recognition of that the only true thing, the only way to kind of spend our lives and spend our energy is to put it in the direction that, that history is going already, in the direction of overthrowing uh, uh, of capitalism, of, of ending this dead end of class society that it has reached and paving the way for a, a, a new society without classes uh, to, for a true free development of human society. Thanks. <coughs>